Hello, I'm Steve Maskery and I have built an absolutely fantastic flip-stop fence for my sliding compound miter saw. I've got over a meter of capacity on this and there's an extension which more than doubles that. The flip-stop slides along the fence like that and I can set it with this cursor against the scale to any dimension I want and it flips out of the way so that I can get a square end on a board and then drops back so that I can use it as a stop. And all my pieces will then be exactly the same size and exactly the dimension that I intended. And it's all made from a 50-year-old bookcase and a 90-year-old interior door. Welcome to Workshop Essentials. This is my sliding compound miter saw and a very fine machine it is too. There are a few things about it which need augmenting shall we say and the main thing is that the fence is very short. It is on all sliding compound miter saws. This is what you get. It's what's that 30 centimeters a foot and uh, it, it offers support right up against the blade yes but not when you try to do something long, there's nothing at the back end there. I have fitted this auxiliary fence, and this is the second one I've made. And quite frankly, it's not as good as the first one I made. It's made out of MDF, and the fence has got quite a lot of flexibility in it, and it's not even always straight. Some days it's quite curved. It depends upon the weather. There are things about it that are good, for example, the way it attaches to the saw itself. I've got a couple of toggle clamps at the back here. And it just lifts off. And that's the fixing mechanism. It's a block of wood. This shaped piece here fits into this notch here. Now, your saw may not have a notch like that, but there will be something that you can register against. So that goes in there like that and the toggle clamps hold it in place. And that does not move left or right, so I know that that goes in exactly the same place time and time again. It's not perfect because there is a bit of movement that way. If this piece isn't vertical, it's going to make a massive difference, especially on a mitre cut. So in that case, I have to make sure that I've got it held vertically. Now, if you can't find any sort of notch or hole or something like that on your casting that you can use as a reference point then you've always got the option of using the fence that came with the saw and this is a very nice aluminium casting um, it's got elongated slots in so that's not so much use to us um, for, lo for location but this can go on the saw like that and be moved as far up as we can. And if that's locked in place, that will always be in that position every single time. And so I could drill this out if I wanted to and screw my fence to it. Um, I don't need to do that on mine, but you could if that was the only way you could get it in place. But the point is your saw a fence has got to be in exactly the same place time and time again. Otherwise, there's no point having a scale on it at all. The other thing I don't like about my, my um, auxiliary fence is the stop. Now, this is a Norm design. I have got a lot of time for Norm. Respect, he's done a lot for woodworkers, not just in the States, but all over the world, in fact. But this is not his greatest design, actually. It, uh, it rides on the top like that, backwards and forwards, and you tighten it up like that, and that's fine, until you knock it when you put your wood on and you can lose a millimetre or two quite easily. It's, it's not good. We can do better. And the last thing I don't like about it is the fact that despite the fact that I sealed this top edge with PVA, the uh, self-adhesive tape measure that was on there didn't last very long before it started to peel off. Because this is MDF and it's woolly and it's not very nice. So we can do better. Now, last year, I was given half a dozen doors that were taken out of a 1930s house. And um, they're covered in varnish, 
And this is about the longest length I can get out of it. This was one of the uh, muntins from the, from the lower panels. Uh, so by the time you've cleaned it up, you've not got a lot left. And some of the other pieces are, are even shorter and have got the dowels in from the uh, manufacturing process. Yes, they were using dowel joinery in the 1930s. But the wood itself is dead straight, obviously very well seasoned, and um, we can use this for a fence even though these pieces aren't long enough. So what I've done is I've taken the longest pieces I could get and I've resawn them to produce veneers that were six or seven or eight millimeters thick. And then using my table saw box joint jig, I've made them longer. And with any lock, these two will go together beautifully. Look at that. Go on. Yay. Fantastic. And then when I've got my longer lengths, I could laminate them together. These are my finished lengths and they are very nice indeed. Can you see the joints? It's there. And that's worked really well. And the result is I've got two pieces like this, long enough for a fence, and I'm gonna make it so that you can put one on the end of the other for really long stuff. And it is beautiful. It is clean, it is straight as a die, straight as an arrow look, and, um, and it's very, very stiff. There's very little give in that, even at this sort of um, stress. So when it's on here, there's actually very, very little, much less flex than there was with the MDF. It's not that long ago when you could buy aluminium T-Track like this fairly affordably. I mean, it's never been cheap, but places like Rutland's you used to get four pieces, four foot long, that's 1.2 meters for 30 quid, 29.99. And it was like that for quite a long time, four pieces, 30 quid which works out at about six pounds a meter, I think. Now they're selling two pieces at one meter for the same price. So it's gone from being six pounds a meter to 15 pounds a meter. That's not normal inflation, guys. So you go down to your local Ikea, you pick up some meatballs because they are fantastic. And at the same time, you pick up a curtain track like this. And this curtain track cost me nine pounds. And it's got two channels in it. There's a web and it's not quite in the middle, which means we've got a shallow channel and a deep channel. And we can make use of that. It's nice and rigid, even though it's quite lightweight. And I'm going to mount that on the top of my fence. And my stop is going to ride in that channel. That is nice. I like that. I like that very much. Good. I've decided I'm going to try and get rid of this tipping backwards and forwards, even though it's not that much of a problem. A Rolls-Royce fence deserves a Rolls-Royce fixing. So I'm still going to use this notch for registration, but instead of having those toggle clamps, I'm going to bolt it through and I'm going to embed a nut, or I might even embed the, the bolt actually, into the front face of the fence. And the only problem is that it is quite close to the edge, but I don't think it's too close to the edge. I think I'll get away with it. And I think that will be a much more firm fixing. I've decided that I will bolt this in place. It won't be quite as convenient for removing it, but I don't often have to remove it, so it's no big deal, really. And look what a difference it's making. Look at that. That is rock solid. That was a good idea, Steve. 
I'm going to keep the two halves of the fence aligned with a domino. And using my waggleometer, I can see that I can have it on maximum waggle. And that will fit quite nicely, I think. I think that's very suitable. The smell of this stuff is fantastic. So that's glued in there. Oh, let's just tighten those two screws up. And then when they go together, that will tighten up like that. I don't know if you can see, but there is a little ridge that runs down the middle of this. And it means that when you try to put a screw on it, the screw falls off the ridge and goes to one side, which is a bit untidy to say the least. So I happen to have bought a little cordless mini tool thing, rotary cut tool thing this morning, just on spec, it was just there in little. So I'm going to grind off that ridge where I need to and I hope that the second curtain track that I fit is neater than the first one. It's a bit dentist-like. <laughs> Look at this, isn't this fantastic? I've got, I've got over nine feet of capacity here. And it's absolutely rock solid. Look, the fence is more solid than the stand is. Brilliant. Dead pleased with that. Now, you didn't tell me I was doing this wrong, did you? You let me get this far. I originally made it so that the T-track stuck out beyond the end of the main fence. And the extension effectively went in from underneath. But that means it can drop a little bit because this domino only keeps the front faces aligned. It doesn't really uh, give total support up and down, there is a little bit of clearance so they can get it in. So I've cut a bit off and now the extension overlaps the main fence. So when it goes in like that, the main fence is supporting the extension and the extension can't fall down. So the next stage is to make a um, an adjustable stop and calibrate it on a scale. I need to make it so that the flip stop allows the Bristol lever to turn and the cursor doesn't foul on the Bristol lever itself. So the first challenge is to prevent the Bristol lever sticking up any more than is absolutely necessary. So I'm routing a cove at the front to allow the Bristol lever to sit low down. There is also a shallow groove on the underside to house an alignment key, which stops it racking and lets it slide smoothly. So this key will run in the top track and that will slide backwards and forwards like that. And there's no play. Good. The pivot point, however, needs to be up high so that the cursor swings up over the Bristol lever. I've cut away the middle part of the key to make room for a sliding nut and now this pivot hole is 6mm for an M6 rod. I don't want any play at all. The clamping hole, however, is 6.5mm so that I do have a bit of clearance for my M6 Bristol lever. I actually made two stop blocks. With the first one, Let's be generous and call it a prototype rather than a long series of cock-ups, shall we? I didn't get the geometry right. Jolly good. But the second one is right. So this is my finished stop. And that slides in the end there like that. Just like that. It does go in, there we go. That's the and then that slides along there. And just tightens up. And then I can put the lever out of the way at the back. There we go. Right, well I've cut a, a couple of L-shaped pieces of wood for the side pieces 
and they are going to pivot on there like that somehow. So we put our cursor material in place, just hold it in place like that, like that, and then poke through with a six millimeter drill. And that will show me, let's make sure that it's in place, there you go, that will show me exactly where I need to drill, just there. And of course the same on the other one. So now it's assembled, these are going to flip back like that. And the Bristol lever still operates, it just clears it there, look. So that's all right. And I've checked, it is going to, when the, when the um, cursor is on there, it is going to clear the Bristol. Where's the cursor? Where put the, the trouble with having a transparent, here we are. The trouble with having a transparent <laughs> cursor is when you put it down, you can't find it. So that's going to be in there like that. And when the whole thing comes up, it does actually clear the Bristol lever there. Now, the only problem is this is actually, it looks as if it's sort of in the bottom of a deep dark hole. So to make it easier to see, I'm just gonna reshape this, something like that. I'm gonna keep my nice broad bottom here because that'll be helpful. Uh, but I'm gonna cut that away to make seeing the scale in here a little bit easier. After shaping the sides, I've routed a shallow groove near the bottom end. Then the bottom piece has corresponding tongs routed. I think that's going to glue up very nicely. And then this can just be trimmed off. Yeah, smashing. I need two mounting holes for the sacrificial stop. And it's easier to drill for these now than after glue up. There we are, very nice. What's up with this clamp? Nice and flush, excellent. So mechanically, this is finished. It slides nicely like that, locks in place. And the flip stop is not fouled by the Bristol lever. And even when the um, cursor is installed, it won't. And similarly, the Bristol lever doesn't foul on the flip stop itself. So that's really nice, I like that. The only thing is it, it looks a bit grubby. And it's because this is very old plywood. This was from a bookcase that my dad made. So it's, it could be 50 years old. It might even be older than I am. I don't know. So it looks a bit sort of grubby. I might paint it. I've put a bit of masking tape on the back with a line on it, which I can see through from this side. And... I'm going to mark a very strong scratch. Like that. And when that's got a bit of ink in it, that'll show up really nicely. And that's the scratch side, so that goes that way. We'll see if this double-sided tape does keep it in place or whether I have to find something more mechanical. So this is where we're up to. I've got the flip stop with a cursor on it and I need to attach a scale and calibrate it. So to do that, I get the flip stop as close to the saw as I can get it without interfering with the guard mechanism. So about there. And then I've marked on the T-track a little mark to show me that that is gonna be roughly where zero is. So let's just move that out of the way for a minute. Now, the tape that I've ordered hasn't arrived, so I can't show you, but I have got one that runs left to right, obviously I would need right to left. This runs left to right, which means all my numbers are gonna be upside down, but it will show the principle. 
So for a longer tape, I would measure from that zero to the break in the track, cut the tape in half there, and then install it so that that, in this case, one meter 25 position, is dead flush with the end of the track. And so my uh, zero position will end up round about here. But it's that end that needs to be dead flush so that the rest of the tape can be attached to the extension and the scale will run right through. Now, this, this runs the wrong way. This runs from left to right. So all my numbers are going to be upside down. But this is going to go be stuck there on the T-track so that the zero position is against that mark. But it's a bit tricky to do this, so I'll have to do it while you're not looking. All right, I'll see you in a minute. And the last job is to fit the sacrificial stop. Now, this will get used up regularly. Anytime I do any changes to the saw, like fit a new blade or adjust it for square, a couple of days ago I noticed that it wasn't perfectly square, so I spent half an hour making the adjustments to get this 90 degrees to the fence and the blade 90 degrees to the table. Anytime I do anything like that, this is going to be reset to zero. So... I've got a couple of holes in it, and that is going to go in there like that. And screw it in place. There we go. And then set that on the zero mark. That's now zero, and we simply cut it off. So now my stop reads the zero and it is a zero because I've just cut the end off. So to use it, I simply move it to wherever I want on the scale. Let's say I want 350 millimeters, which is about there. I can flip it out of the way whilst I get a square end and then drop it back. And then I know that every piece that I cut at that setting not only going to be the same, but they're going to be accurately 350 millimetres long. So, that's my fantastic saw fence. If you've got a crosscut saw, I really hope you will consider making something like this up, because it makes using the saw so much easier. It's robust, it doesn't move, it's accurate, it's got bags of capacity. I mean, that end is halfway to Derby, and I don't have to have it that long when I don't need it to be that long. The, re the, the extension bit will hang on the wall, actually. So, thank you very much for watching. If you've enjoyed it, please remember to like and subscribe and share. It matters. And until the next time, enjoy your workshop. Cheerio.